okay. Okay. So <clears throat> I always I I I began a man I I I I I I I began to be a mannerist. I I I noticed. I I always start with okay. Um, you know. Uh, may I should change the introduction. So Ricardo Poro born in 1925, died in 2014, and he was born today. It was a little bit difficult to find his uh, date of birth because on the British, English and British Wikipedia, it just says November 1925. But on the French Wikipedia, it says the 3rd of December 1925. And the site where I take my uh, dates of celebration uh, or paying homages, also uh, has the same date, December 3rd, 1925. So Ricardo Poro he, Hidalgo was a Cuban born, you see even here, I mean, this was from the wish, uh, the American Wikipedia, uh, was, was a Cuban born architect. He graduated in architecture from the Universidad, Universidad de la Habana, University of Havana in 1949 and built this year his first project, Villa Armenteros in Havana, following which he spent two years in postgraduate studies at the Institute of Urbanism at the Sorbonne in Paris. Well, that's not a little thing. I mean, you know, uh, yes, it was immediately after the war, but uh, it shows that, you know, he was already uh, on his way to uh, you know, some some professional uh, accomplishment. This was the man, and I, 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 I like the way he looks. Uh, um, is, uh, he seems to be intense and sensitive, and he seems to have known something about suffering, or I idealize my, my, through my perception. I don't know, but I, I, I like what I see, and I like what, uh, what uh, he might uh, have represented. Then and even this, uh, the surroundings of his uh, picture, uh, you know, with that lamp, and uh, if it is indeed a lamp, and whatever is on the right, it's a nice picture, I think. Um, and here he is in his older age. Uh, he doesn't look really like a, a man who doesn't have enough verticality, I think he does. And but but here he is at the age when, when he already accomplished many buildings and not buildings without um, uh, architectural interest at all. Although, again, you will be surprised because he was indeed uh, uh, unique, especially for that time. Now, the, the sites where I took my information from sometimes, and I had no time to correct, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, the phrasing would start with a small, uh, like here, small V. But please forgive this. Uh, you know, uh, uh, details if you can, and uh, we move forward. Unfortunately, I couldn't find pictures for, for his um, domestic works within Cuba. Uh, at that time, I guess in the 50s in Cuba, you know, it was complicated. Um, he might have been considered just like uh, Konstantin Melnikov in Moscow as a bourgeois architect. It's possible. After all, you know, it was a communist country and, uh, you know, to build villas, you know, it sounds a little bit incongruous, but uh, the same happened with the next one, another villa, San Miguel, a la Havan. This also I couldn't find pictures of. Then the third one is different. This is a major work by him, the Cuban National Art School. And it uh, makes me envious of the level of sophistication of togetherness, of democratic spirit, of experimental um, atmosphere that, that this school was um, encouraged to uh, promote and express architecturally. It is a major work of architecture and uh, no wonder I have many pictures. I found many pictures on Arch Daily and uh, it is one of his uh, most important buildings. It's also called in English, the National Art Schools of Cuba, Ricardo Poro, Vittorio Garati, Roberto Gotardi. So three architects, but he was the, 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 main, one, the main one. This is a, a view from the top, from the air, uh, Avol d'Oiseau. And, uh, you know, 
Is this communist? Is this capitalist? Is it what? It's architecture. It's an architecture that transcends uh, political ideologies. Uh, and um, it was built. It was built in a country which uh, the West and, and especially the United States considered as being uh, you know, repressive and uh, irrelevant uh, to culture uh, or culture being irrelevant to, to it. But, uh, you know, I don't know how many Western countries build such a, you know, large campus for the arts as Cuba did at that time. And, uh, you know, he was young, rather young. And, uh, you know, uh, I read about this building that, well, some parts have, had been uh, neglected, but uh, all in all, uh, it's uh, also some pictures that I have belong to different times. They were taken at different times. So, um, you know, it's very possible now it is very well taken care of and refurbished and so on. Um, model, uh, it, it was a working progress. It kept growing and developing and maybe it continues to, to, to do so. Um, you know, it's an architecture maybe here not as surprising as some some buildings he built in France, but will arrive at those buildings built in France as well, and he built a lot. But in France he worked with a with a partner. Uh, here he worked both alone and with those two gentlemen with whom he built uh, uh, this uh, you know this this campus. There is a certain exoticism in his architecture. But it is not, uh, you know, alarmingly, um, you know, uh, different or, uh, you know, other. It, 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 there is an otherness in his architecture. And again, please, co please consider the time. I mean, we are talking about the 50s, uh, mid-century architecture, mid-20th century architecture. If you look at similar works, I mean, uh, architectural works, around that time all over the world, you won't see too much, uh, you know, um, exoticism really. It was more like some kind of a international style, a certain belief in, uh, you know, uh, not so much fluidity, but uh, rigor and re rectangularity, Miss van der Rohe. But here you will see uh, at times he was very exotic. I would say he was and probably is the architect who understood butterflies the better, the best. And you will see some buildings where the butterfly motif is, uh, is uh, very explicitly uh, present. Here, on the other hand, we have an architecture of, of uh, structural rigor, uh, clarity, but also um, not a dry cl clarity, I would say. And um, I think it's a good building uh, and a complex of buildings. If the spirit of architecture is genuine and is alive, then I think any so-called style is, is acceptable, except uh, perhaps the very worst style itself, because I think great architecture is somehow beyond style or styles, except especially in, um, in contemporary times or, or modern times, because I don't think, um, um, uh, I know the word is sometimes still used uh, even in relation with the moderns, but I, I think, uh, for example, Le Corbusier would have pro protested. I don't think he would have liked to, 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 to have his uh, word, uh, work labeled uh, with the word uh, style. So, um, I, 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 you know, these, these buildings <clears throat> seem almost, uh, <clears throat> they make me think a little bit of uh, Arcosanti, of uh, Paolo Soleri. Uh, so they had this uh, almost extraterrestrial quality. And uh, look at the, the pavement, you know, it's not flat. It's, uh, it's, it has its uh, undulations and it's, uh, you know, disc more or less discrete, um, you know, uh, curves which makes it interesting, I think. And, and this is often not done even in very fluid architectures of today. This is a problem even with uh, Zaha Hadid or Med architects 
They make very interesting and flamboyant even buildings, but, but often the, the, the slabs are horizontal slabs, which is a problem because if the, the, the slab is, doesn't have itself some kind of accidents and, and, and fluidity, then uh, there seems to be some artificiality here. Uh, there. But uh, it seems that uh, Ricardo Porro uh, handled it when it was the place to have a horizontal circulation like here, he did it uh, quite well. So there is, uh, you know, uh, structural uh, integrity, but uh, there is more to it. And uh, maybe this fact that he organized uh, the, the, the whole scheme as a, as a uh, conglomerate of, of pavilions, um, And you see, even when the building is, you know, uh, kept in a questionable way, uh, if the, the architectural conception is uh, genuine, uh, the spirit of its creator comes through, I think. Uh, and, and so a certain level of nobility is not affected by the poor uh, care of the building, I would say. Now, of course, we, 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 we saw many excesses in architecture. We saw many forms, we saw many uh, experiments. Maybe we are not uh, very, very excited about what we see now here, but we have to understand this, this, this was built in Cuba in 1950s. And, uh, you know, if Cuba was not the richest place on earth. And uh, I don't know if it had uh, an interest in innovative uh, architecture, but here, not just the architecture was to an extent innovative, but also the social program. I understood this was a house, well, a house, a building meant to encourage uh, creativity in a, in a very exuberant way. Castro seemed to be at that time uh, favoring uh, developing, uh, cultural programs at the national level. Uh, and uh, again, this is something uh, perhaps to be envied. I mean, you know, there was demagogy in communism as well that, um, you know, uh, culture first, uh, art first, uh, but if there were restrictions. But in Cuba at that time, at least at the beginning, it seems it wasn't so restrictive the, the intellectual or the cultural climate. So uh, there are also elements, you know, kind of traditional. Here he is not as wild as he will be in some of his later works. You'll see that. I, I still, I still like this, this, this complex of buildings. And um, yes, there are leakings probably. Well, there are leakings everywhere in the world. In Vienna. In, New York, uh, it doesn't matter, you know. I lived in various places, in various apartments at the top floor, and uh, I have to say, <laughs> the leakings are almost uh, unavoidable. Now, he's more domestic than Louis Kahn. I mean, you could be tempted a little bit to think of Kahn a little bit in connection with his building. Uh, Kahn seemed to be more radical, but, but Ricardo Porro was more radical himself uh, in some other buildings and, and will arrive at them. Now the tree, of course, such a glorious tree is in itself uh, a, a wonder. So, uh, you know, almost it doesn't matter how the building is, but look at that, uh, at the magnificent tree. So 1950s, Havana, Cuba. I don't know exactly, probably because of political reasons, he left Cuba and settled in, uh, in, uh, in France. And we'll see some works he did uh, soon after he arrived in France. Now with a, I don't know if he had a PhD in architecture or urbanism from Sorbonne, I guess he was already on his way to accommodate himself to the French culture.
he is not, although I think he is relevant for us today, with other architects like Bart Prince in the United States, I mentioned um, Paolo Soleri. Uh, there are certain architects who didn't follow the modern, the, the modern paradigm uh, explicitly or predictably like so many other architects. So they are a little bit off. Why? Because they promoted an organic architecture. And organic architecture, strangely, even in the United States, didn't have too many followers. I was very surprised when I attended lectures at Columbia University in New York to see that and hear that actually New Yorkers never mentioned the, word, the name of Frank Lloyd Wright. You know, they, they were seduced by Europe, by the European architects, starting with Le Corbusier, but they didn't mention, you know, their, their most important architects, local architects, if we can call them so, you know, Sullivan, Richardson, um, Wright. So I was very surprised. Of course, in, in the Midwest, things are different, but on the East Coast, strangely, uh, they were much more interested in European architecture than in, in their own culture, their own architecture. Th that one that actually gave character to, to, to the North American architecture. Look at the plan. I think it's, it's, it's beautiful. You know, probably, uh, you know, this, you know, he proposed various developments truly like truly to be a world in, in itself the world of art but i love the site plan you know it's 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 organic it's mysterious it's intricate uh, it's 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 very very nice it makes me think a little bit but it's much more fluid and organic than some uh, exercises by john haydock uh, they are very, very different architects, but I think Ricardo Porro, if these buildings would have been built just as he insinuated them on this site plan would have been great. Anyway, uh, he built something and he couldn't build other things. Now we go to Liechtenstein in 1975, so he left. He pro I don't know, it's possible because of political reasons, he left Cuba. He settled in France. And now we'll see the Centre d'Art, the, 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 the art center, uh, Lord, uh, Lord Durand, uh, the, the, the gold of, of Rhine uh, in Liechtenstein. Uh, it's, it's an European building, but look at this, with the exception of this, this part of the building, which is more pedestrian and uh, you know, predictable, but what is here, I think it is very interesting. And um, he never, re well, not troll, truly never and not truly totally, but he, uh, I think, um, uh, avoided the trappings of postmodernism for, 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 uh, for a good part of his work, which was not easy at all. With Renaud de la Noue, uh, he, uh, this was his partner, so they created together their office, Poro and uh, De La Nu, uh, and uh, I think they did a few remarkable buildings and we'll, we'll see all of them. Yes, it is an European culture. Yes, it is a culture which has a certain level of predictability, but it also has things that were very unusual at that time. I don't know if this artwork belongs to them or uh, to an artist commissioned by them, but there seems to be kind of the same spirit also in the building. Some kind of uh, an exotic uh, Gothicism or uh, in other works, there is a Baroque uh, sensibility. Uh, there is also uh, this fortress-like uh, aesthetics, but it is sweetened by, um, you know, uh, look how the glass is done. You know, it's the glass part of the, of the, of the building is also a creation. It's not just, it doesn't, doesn't just, you know, put some glass here. It, it's a creation, you can tell. It has a certain complexity. So um, on the other hand, as a whole, the building expresses 
uh, unity and and uh, integrity and you know to us to an extent force but he also has or they have these kind of things this is what uh, uh, differentiates their architecture from other people's architecture uh, of course there are uh, other french architects who i mean even if you didn't know that this was done by an architect who lived then in france you would see something of the of the aesthetics of modern architecture in france after the war and after the death of, uh, or about the, you know, Le Corbusier died in 1965. Well, this one was built in 1970 something. Um, I find I find his architecture interesting because he's able to create unexpected parts of the building there where it matters, and that is in the public parts of the building. He built several schools. They built several schools, and you are going to see them, both colleges and high schools, and some of them quite uh, quite interesting. Look at the interior. You know, it's it has character. It has a certain level of complexity. It has a certain level of exaltation. It is not Antoni Gaudi, yes, and uh, but but it was built in the second half of the 20th century, and. Uh, Again, the, the type of sensibility that we see here at work is, uh, is a rather unique, uh, as far as I know, in, um, in modern architecture. On the other hand, he can be reticent. You know, yes, there is, uh, there are, there is spectacle, there is uh, uh, play with volumes and, uh, you know, uh, a certain drama, but... Um, in good measure, his architect could also be reticent with some accents, like here, you know, which which intrigue, which invite you. It's this corner, this 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 part of the building is where the entrance into the building takes place. So it's it's a special place. It's a, the place of encounters. It's the place of the ritual of transition. You step over the threshold there. So it has to be different. And it is different. Then look at the plan. You know, eh, this is Ricardo Poro. Eh, it might have certain similarities to an extent with um, Hans Sharun, maybe. Um, and then there was another couple in, in the 80s, a little later, German architects, I forgot their names. But, you know, European organicism is different from the North American one. Here we have a uh, French uh, expressionism, but uh, with, with some rooting in, in Cuba. So, you know, there is an inevitable, probably, exoticism, uh, you know, being generated from, from this fact alone. Immeuble de logement, as so this is from 1990. Um, uh, again, you know, who, how many architects use the ellipse? You know, it's just a courtyard, but uh, still the, the composition is, um, you know, uh, it, 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 the spiral is present. The spiral and the spiral in itself is a scandal for, for intelligence, just like, uh, just like the, the, the labyrinth. We saw these kind of stairs leading into the buildings by uh, Aravena, uh, but but because here we have the courtyard that is uh, elliptic or uh, ellipse uh, in shape, uh, things are a little bit uh, advocating a certain uh, irrationality, if I can say so, and 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 a certain kind of moving against you know, the, the certitudes of the circle. Paolo Portoghesi maybe also could come to mind, a certain architecture by Imre Makovic, perhaps, but, but still Poro, uh, Ricardo Poro is, uh, is different. So, uh, Collège Colonel Fabien à Montreuil, uh, this one, I have in two versions in the presentation. One is just the Fabian, Fabian's uh, Ecole. The other one, this one maybe is more, the wording is more correct. 
Polish colonel Fabian. Sounds a little bit strange you not know, to have a, you know, a military figure uh, give the name to the college. But again, the building has a certain level of fluidity, which at the time when it was built wasn't so very common. They were still working uh, manually, uh, hand drawing, and I, I had a hand drawing, uh, a handmade drawing in the presentation, but it was so ugly in my opinion that I, I had to eliminate it. A kind of a rendering. You know, uh, then, uh, yes. Yeah, if you do this kind of a column and this this kind of an element, the roof uh, in a, I think, uh, design school, I mean, architecture school, it'll be very difficult to justify it. <laughs> what? Uh, sorry? It would be uh, difficult to what? Difficult to ju justify it in a jury, I mean, in your uh, exam jury. Uh, if you If you do this kind of an element, the column, well, of course, uh, and also look here, you know, uh, look at the, this cornice. I mean, but the problem yeah. with most schools of architecture is that they are stuck. They are, they, they are actually not looking through the window. They don't look at nature, at trees, at bushes, at birds, and they don't look in their own soul. And, 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 and that's why we have so much dogma in Ahmedabad and in Bucharest and in other parts of the world. Because people think that uh, you know certain things cannot be done, but why not? I actually think this is a very valid architecture. It might not be uh, you know in accordance with our own beliefs, but uh, no, it, it is valid. Uh, in my opinion, it is valid. This one is valid too. It has a certain <laughs> expression, is, but why not? You know, this is the the edge, is the corner of the building. Uh, so, as I said, he was a unique architect, especially for his time, but even for our time, perhaps. Um, look, you know, this is Europe, the second half of the 20th century. Yes, most schools of architecture would accept something like this and not something like this. But, but, but why not? Just because uh, they look unusual. Uh, they seem to have rigor. Look at the, you know, everything, the way it was built, uh, the roofing, and yes, I, I, I think he was genuine as an architect. Um, and uh, you know, if I'm to compare this building to this building, I'm sorry, I like this one more than this one. I mean, this one is, is blunt, is brutal, is simplistic. This one you could criticize if you want to criticize a certain mellow, uh, mellowness or mellow line uh, of it, but all in all, it's an attempt to, to, to create something else, something different, something maybe a little bit medieval, but also medieval, but also a little bit futuristic. I find it interesting. And, uh, you know, he also worked, he, he didn't work with that, uh, overused, uh, you know, curtain wall. No, he has windows, you know, windows, uh, but uh, there is a large repertoire of windows here. I think he's interesting. Uh, and, uh, and look at this, these are houses. This is an apartment building. Uh, can you believe it? But why not? Why shouldn't an apartment building look like this? I don't think it's more to, to be blamed here than in a regular, so-called regular, you know, apartment building that we have so many of. Now, this is an interesting work uh, uh, finalized in 2003. I don't know very well. I mean, I know how to translate in Romanian, but in English, calzonment is something, you know, um, I don't know, but look at this. Obviously, there was some influence from deconstructivism, but you cannot say that, uh, that this, what we see here, doesn't have a certain appeal, uh, certainly for those with a disposition towards uh, deconstruction. Uh, he was already, you know, uh, 75 years old, uh, 78 years old when he built this when they build this, but uh, it's, it's interesting. And it's, you know, it's not just that. It's, you look, look at these interstitial spaces. We'll see pictures with the building finalized as well. These are just some pictures 
you are in construction. Uh, like here, you know, you can tell that this is an adventure for the builder, for the architects. It, it's a quest, it's an adventure, it's an it's a, um, experimentation. I, I think that's how architecture should be, you know, like, uh, yeah, like an event, you know, like uh, bringing something new into the world. And uh, yes, there might be difficulties and, and pain even and expenditures. But if we go through the effort of building, why not try our best to bring something to the world that would add a little bit of wonder to the world? You know, we need we need that. I think we need uh, we need things to take us out of our um, you know inertia and uh, complacency, and that's what I think. Usually, great artists and architects and musicians and writers and so on did and do. We need a poet. And uh, he was, to an extent, a poet. You might not like his poetry or like just part of it, but he was a poet. Look, look here, just at these, at, at these elements, you know. You would say they are gratuitous. They are, you know, they, why are they there? Well, not everything that we do is to be explained or, or uh, made legitimate by reason alone or functionalism. I, I don't think so. I think that's him here, yeah, because he has a cane. Uh, I like his, um, you know, uh, coat, and this is probably his partner, uh, younger. And I look at the building how it is being um, uh, it is being built. We saw this one, and uh, you know there are all kinds of things happening here. You know, you you could say, well, this is very close to Eric Owen Moss. Yeah, to an extent, it is. But there is, there is something else. And here I know they drew mostly manually. I don't know if specifically for this building, but they were not, uh, they didn't have, you know, a factory like Frank Gehry, you know, with NASA like, you know. Uh, they, they, these are uh, analog architects, so to speak. And maybe yes, later they also began to use uh, computers, but, but he used to be like this even before the arrival of the computer. Now we see the Lycée High School, Julie Victoire Daubier uh, is from 2010. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> this one looks a little bit like a stadium. Uh, it's probably a large uh, building. It is a large building. And uh, I don't know, this is not one of my preferred ones, although there are parts of it which are interesting. And I mentioned the butterfly. You see even these, uh, these columns. It's an interesting idea, you know, to create a column which doesn't reach, uh, doesn't, doesn't go all the way to the ceiling, but then you have the intermediate part, these two wings, so-called butterfly wings, that support actually, that have the structural role. So it's an interesting idea, you know, the column doesn't reach actually what is supposed to, to, to support, and then you have a third element, in this case, these wings that do the do that job. Interesting, I think. And uh, I, I, I don't know of another architect who did something similar. Then uh, isn't this influence of Venturi Scott Brown? Mm. A little bit. I uh, don't really. This element above the column. <laughs> No, I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that uh, Venturi Scott uh, Brown uh, influenced him, because because Venturi Scott Brown were, uh, you know, immersed or, or they 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 emerged themselves from a different kind of culture. I think he is mostly, uh, you know, who knows some atavistic uh, part of his upbringing of his childhood, you know, in Cuba maybe his love of nature. Um, you'll see in other parts of, in other buildings by him, uh, uh, an explicit reference to, to butterflies. And, but he's also an abstract artist. And, uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't uh, no, because there is also an expressionist here, you know, like in this, this part of the building that, uh, 
but it's a it's a it's a it's a curved expression is so to speak it's not a it's not a an aggressive really uh, yes it could it could have been but it is not because this curvature you know turns around and it, it becomes uh, um, if not graceful but it becomes accommodating so um, it, it's, this is not German expression it's, and and uh, and, uh, and the butterfly wings create this uh, literal reference to something that in its essence is uh, you know about the beautiful uh, uh, you know ephemerality of nature you know the butterflies the but I, 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 I suggest to you if you want, uh, there is a, a little poem by uh, Joseph Brodsky called The Butterfly. And uh, even Emil Joran talked about the butterfly, you know. Uh, the butterfly is fascinating, you know. It's so beautiful and at the same time, you know, it, it vanishes, uh, you know, uh, it's almost a beautiful non-existence. And so to bring the butterfly into architecture, you know, the metaphor of the butterfly, is rather unique. I don't know of any other architect who, who does it. This is the, the plan. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, this kind of Baroque aesthetics, uh, at least in part Baroque, in, in some parts of his buildings, he is reticent, but in others, there is uh, clearly a Baroque sensibility. Now, if he was from Brazil, which has a great uh, tradition of uh, Baroque, art and Baroque architecture, if I am to think just of uh, Ale Giardini or the little triple, but not only that, there is a, a, a very important Baroque uh, art and architecture in Brazil, but he is from Cuba. So, um, also at that time, who had the courage to bring in decorative elements? Because these wings or whatever they are, we could call them in, with different names, do have, a, um, um, I think, a, a decorative uh, function. Even if in some cases, it also, even here, you know, it, look, is this column supports uh, two beams uh, uh, interestingly, from through these intermediate, uh, you know, the, I call them butterfly wings, but uh, you know, could be called in any other way. It's an interesting idea because it is an interesting idea which also connects with the tradition of architecture. You know, the column, the classical columns, had a capital which was also had volutes and they had uh, a certain formal complexity. Here he replaced that with these uh, abstracted and large scale uh, elements. So it is as if, let's say, this is a, a you know a structural element. This is a structural element, but in between them he introduces something which, in its essence, evokes vulnerability. So he brings in a level of instability, at least mental instability, and because of it. Uh, the structure that could have been heavy is not heavy any longer. It's almost as if you would say, well, the, the, these, uh, these uh, I keep calling them, maybe they could receive other words, other names, these butterfly wings support the heaviness of the building. And I, I, I like the, 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 the sensibility behind it because it's very much Lao Tzu or Lao Tse who advocated, who saw that the weak, the so-called weak can be stronger than the, than the strong. And he gave as an example, you know, the, the blade of grass, which lowers its head when the thunderbolt strikes and the oak, if the oak, the proud, solid, uh, rigid oak is, uh, is, is hit by the, by the thunderbolt, it dies, but not the blade of grass. He also mentioned water, water which seems to be vulnerable and, and weak in its uh, conflict, conflict with stone, with a rock. It actually erodes the rock. The weakest water erodes the strongest sto uh, stone or rock. Uh, here, that's, I, I mean, I'm just improvising, but it's something that I like about this idea 
also, you know, I mean, in uh, conventional architecture, you just had here a straight uh, column, you know, you had a vertical column and then the horizontal curved or not beams, but here it brings the, the col column outside of the structure and from its top and on its side spring two other elements that support the, 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 the horizontal uh, structural elements. I, I think it's interesting, it's an interesting idea. Uh, and I never saw it done before. Uh, except in classical architecture, where you had um, the, the intermediate element between the column and the, uh, the, the beams, which is the capital, which, which could be done in a Doric way or, uh, you know, uh, the others, Corinthian, composite, and Ionic, Ionic. This is also an interesting uh, building. Uh, he also, he, you know, he's thinking of a discrete joining of the column, in this case, not vertical and, and, and this roofing. So there is a certain legerity, there is a certain, uh, it's not heavy, something which could have been heavy. On the other hand, maybe there is a little bit of, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, there is a little bit of, of, of uh, there is a ludic element in his architecture, but the telluric is a little bit different, is different from Gaudi, Antoni Gaudi's. It, his architecture is organic, but um, I don't know if I can explain now well what I feel, particularly looking at this building. The, the, the butterfly still insinuates itself in the windows done in a, in, in a certain way, you know, which brings some question marks in relation with the clarity of the, of the structure. And these question marks, I believe, are uh, again valid. Uh, so this heavy thing is actually not as heavy thanks to the way he supports it, I think. And you see, he's not afraid to take risks. Here, he could have placed a vertical column. No, it's not vertical. Neither this one and neither this one, I think. This one might be, I don't know, but these two are not, obviously. Now, this is a psychiatric hospital from 2007. The, the problem with his architecture is if I am to think of, of uh, Alvaralto, Alvaralto also had spaces that were not dramatic in terms of the handling of the volumes of the masses, but in the more public parts of the building, they became more lyrical or more expressionistic. Ricardo Foro does the same thing, uh, but there is, uh, I, th I think Alvar Alto was a little bit more convincing than, uh, than Ricardo Poro, Poro. But on the other hand, Ricardo Poro is, is very different from, uh, from uh, I mean, this is a Latin sensibility here and a certain exuberance that uh, the, the, the Nordic, the Scandinavian uh, Alvar Alto would not have had easily, although, there was expressionism in, uh, in Germany, in, in the North as well, very much so in, in Hamburg, uh, Fritz Herger. But that expressionism was rather anxious. This is not anxious, it's not an anxious, uh, it doesn't seem to be an, an anxious uh, architect. But there are these erosions, you see this, something is eating up the building. The building seems to be rather serene and uh, predictable and regular, and then something happens, an event like here, you know, and uh, this is, I think, interesting. It's important to have surprises in a building, I think. And he creates surprises in, 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 in some select places, not everywhere. A police station, uh, this one um, also has, a, <clears throat> yes, there was an influence of deconstruction. 
you see that where Ricardo Poro and uh, I forgot his first name, Lanu. Um, uh, here you see almost something of Daniel Lipskin, uh, but uh, at the interior, this is something that uh, Lipskin would not have done because here there seems to be some kind of a longing for a certain kind of centrality. It's almost like uh, these are almost like sun rays emanating from a sun-like figure. And um, I don't know, I, I find it interesting. Although it is a deconstructionist building, at least here, but uh, um, there is also something else. I wonder what the policeman felt there, you know, but but the work of the police is uh, is a work which inevitably has at least sometimes conflict, you know, even, uh, you know, war. I mean, war on drugs, war on criminals, war on who knows what. So violence and deconstruction is part of the job in a way. So I would say it's appropriate. This is another building, um, which is a little bit conventional here, but also has some interesting parts, you know, relating to the modern, to the uh, uh, public spaces within the building. Then, then this is an archetypical uh, Ricardo Poro architecture, and uh, is in this very, you know, coherent, and uh, he does it uh, often, and it's really about destabilizing the classical or the, the, the predictable, the stable, the rigid, through various techniques or strategies. Um, also interesting what is happening here, you know, because uh, as Vatsal said in a previous meeting that you don't, you don't need really for a column a lot, you know, maybe the, maybe the, sufficient structural, vertical structural element is just this one, the metallic one on the left. But what is near it is rather decorative. So I think this is also interesting. Now the, the famous Fabian school, and you have more pictures of it here. Again, the, the trademark uh, butterfly wings, the plan, Look at the plan, you know, who was working like this, you know, at the time when he, he was doing, yes, this was early 80s, but I think the, 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 the planning began uh, earlier. Now it says November, November 1990. So um, he was some kind of a pioneer, I think, in, in the field of European not expressionist, but um, organic architecture. And look at the plan. You know, the, this kind of plan was, wasn't very common really. Because it is, it is based on the vortex, on the, on the spiral, and, uh, and uh, as such is, is essentially dynamic. Not everywhere, but in some parts. And it is Baroque, but a modern Baroque. We saw this one. Now here, uh, with the exception of the vertical columns, but when we look at those um, spiral uh, like uh, stairs, you know, we, we are not really too far away from, uh, from um, you know, even uh, Frank Gehry or, uh, but the columns have, have a certain uh, connection with, uh, with uh, uh, different, different kind of aesthetics and different kind of static, you know, um, structural work. And I, I think he's, not that he struggled, but he tried to negotiate between you know, more traditional uh, way of you know, doing the structure and uh, something uh, newer. He also worked with, uh, you know, domes, and uh, this is not at, at all a typical uh, deconstructivist uh, 
strategy or technique. This is also an interesting uh, school complex. Uh, we saw already a few pictures. Um, we see the plans. Maybe Vatsal was right to an extent, you know, maybe one could interpret some of these things somehow connected to complexity and contradiction in architecture, maybe. But these are not uh, really elite buildings. So I mean, these are these are buildings built for maybe even underprivileged uh, communities. But look what is happening here. You know, again the same uh, strategy. You know, this third element, which which is important, and I, I think uh, inspired by this strategy, you could arrive at, uh, at some interesting uh, proposals. Look even here. All, all in all, I would prefer, uh, all in all, I would prefer this than to this. I'm not saying you could have very noble and interesting prisms, but that one doesn't really qualify or seem to be very noble. Uh, sorry, an extension, another lycée, another, you know, kind of a high school. Again, the butterfly, and I think uh, we'll arrive at some pictures soon with uh, with more. Um, uh, I see people are beginning to leave, so I, <laughs> I have to rush. Perhaps the, the presentation is not very interesting, but I, I still think uh, Ricardo Poro is not really an architect to, to, to totally ignore. And look at this ceiling. I mean, this ceiling is uh, is uh, is brilliant, and 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 it's not just. Uh, that you will see some other things here. Um, and look at this space, you know, and look at the way he employs the color also, you know. So I imagine the children, you know, passing by, uh, they, they are influenced by the conditions of light and the colors and those, uh, you know, those butterfly wings, if we have to call them so. There is a, this is an abstract architecture, but it also has a figurative side to it, I think. And, and in that sense, it's interesting. I don't know about this. This is a little bit, uh, but on the other hand, is it really so bad? It's, yeah, it's, it's more predictable. I prefer the inside. I, there is more drama, spatial drama, drama, and I particularly like this, uh, this ceiling because it's a little bit spider-like and it has a certain complexity. It is Gothic, but it's also Art Nouveau and it's sensuous, but it's also rigorous structurally. I think it's interesting. Anyway, this is the plan, uh, a large, large building, that, uh, again, public building and um, Yeah, the, what is interesting is here, you know, not everything in the buildings is interesting, but what is, is around, uh, you know, either the auditorium or the public spaces, the entrance spaces and so on. And this is dramatic and I think, uh, it has a certain value, you know, artistically, architectural. Well, the classrooms, especially without the disorder the children bring in, it seems to be a little dull, it's true. This one also is a little bit placid and, um, you know, Logement, uh, logement. This is a housing process, but I don't have pictures. This is a housing project that I only have one picture. Residence Universitaire, Le Chateau Saint Silvère. Uh, again, he has portions of his buildings where the buildings seem to take off. And uh, it's this accident that makes them a little bit uh, interesting sometimes. 
this one we saw some pictures of it, then Collège Elzal de Triolet, a secondary school. Again, in the corner, the building becomes bird-like a little bit, uh, some housing, and it might be that this is the last picture on uh, Ricardo Porro today. No, this is the last picture, or maybe not, there is a, a, a zoomed-in picture of the architect with his cane, probably around his uh, 80s or so. Thank you very much.